Blessed Christ the King Sunday, as we welcome you to worship today. It is the last Sunday of the church calendar, and it is the beginning of the new calendar. Now, I know in our um, secular calendar that we have, uh, uh, the year doesn't begin until January 1st, which is the circumcision, or should I say the naming, of Jesus. But we begin early. We begin with preparation. And so on this last Sunday of the year, before we move into Advent, Christmas, and of course the new year with the naming of Jesus, we begin with preparation. But we also begin and end with the assurance that Jesus is Lord. And so the history of this day revolves around the assurance that Jesus is Lord, even through the difficult times, even when the snow is raging around us in many parts of the country, even when it seems that our politics is in turmoil, as in some places, even when we have already had the blessing of the harvest and are preparing for the winter months, the darker months, we are reminding ourselves that Christ is Lord. But we ask the question, what does that Lordship look like? And so we'll be doing that in this service. But we begin, as we are called to begin, by recognizing that we need a Savior. And we do this by examining our hearts and minds before God with our conscience open open to God to change us and do a new thing here. And so we begin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our Redeemer, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Son of Righteousness shall rise with shining beams of healing. Let us gather under the wings of God's mercy. Gracious God, we acknowledge that we are sinners and that we confess our sins, those known to us that burden our hearts and that those unknown to us but seen by you. We know that before you nothing remains hidden and in you everything is revealed. Free us from the slavery of sin, liberate us from the bondage of guilt and work in us that which is pleasing in your sight. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us. And because he died for us, he forgives us all our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you, the entire forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, our true life, to serve you is freedom, to know you is unending joy. We worship you, we glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. Abide with us, reign in us, Make this world into a fit habitation for your divine majesty. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A familiar theme in Scripture is shepherds. And they apply not only to priests or pastoral leaders. In fact, the word pastor means shepherd. They also apply to rulers. And so it is fitting that we have the critique of rulers from Jeremiah 23. We might recognize another 23, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. But Jeremiah sees that there are other shepherds in our world who are not the ones that we can trust. Jeremiah 23. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them. I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul writes, May you be strong with the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible the whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. My friends, this is also the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading, I invite you to listen to, are the words of Jesus on the very cross by which he reconciled the world. And so Jesus speaks in Luke 23, beginning with the 33rd verse. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there is also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept writing him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you and I are under the same sentence of condemnation? 
And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. My friends, this is the good news, the gospel of the Lord. What do we say? That Jesus is king and hanging on a cross. Hanged, not because he is receiving the just rewards for his deeds, for we understand that Jesus lived the only one to live in this world, a perfect life, a life with no sin, offering a perfect sacrifice for the sake of the world. At least that's what we are told. But in the midst of the battle, in the midst of all things that we cannot understand, we might question whether he is the king. Like a losing politician, in fact, some tried to go down this route that lost in the previous election about a week and a half ago. One local politician said Jesus did not win his first court case, implying that he was like Jesus and that he would later be justified for his actions. Jesus is presenting it all out. There's no second option. He already tried to negotiate that with God in the Garden of Gethsemane. If there's another way, let it happen. But, Lord, I will take the cup that you give. I'll do the deed. Jesus was doing what other shepherds, other leaders would not do. Leaders that Jeremiah derides in Jeremiah 23. Yet with the prophetic word that God has not given up on the lineage of David. And from David's stump, a very famous image, if not picture, of a stump and yet a little shoot drawing out of the stump showing that this tree even though it seems by all cases dead, is not dead yet. Or shoot will rise out of Jesse. And at all things in heaven and on earth are made for the sake of bringing Jesus into the world and are made for the sake of bringing his church into the world. For as it said at the end of Colossians, that this sacrifice would be for the sake of not just one people, not just a small group of people, it would be for the sake of the whole world. And that's the bold declaration I give you each and every week. That's the bold declaration that we affirm that when Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine, it was for your sins and mine, past, present, and future. It was the final sacrifice. And if we claim his blood, we too will be forgiven. That's how I get that boldness. To say that audacious claim each and every week, your sins are forgiven. Not by my authority, but by the authority of the one who called me to preach, to teach, to be a pastor in God's flock. Not just in flock, but in God's world. But in the midst of a world that is contrary. And it doesn't get any more contrary than on the cross. Leaders, people who we would think would know better, are not praising Jesus 
not weeping for his sacrifice, but deriding him. If you were truly the Messiah of God, we would see power. If you were truly the Messiah of God, we would see our agenda done, not this flimsy agenda. Even criminals who are on either side of Jesus, or at least what it says in Luke's gospel, at least one is deriding him while the other one sees the irony. The other one sees that this man is innocently dying. The other one sees that there is punishment if one finds himself on the wrong side of the law. But what he doesn't understand and what chills him to the bone is his this righteous one next to him. This claim to the messiahship in the same boat as him and yet suffering the same punishment. It doesn't cause him to mock Jesus. It doesn't cause him to doubt Jesus. It causes him to shudder that this one, this innocent one, this one who could heal, this one who could cause the world to stop, the one who, for whom the world was created because he is the very word of God, is suffering next to him. This man gets it. But many times we don't. And that's because we can get distracted by worldly power. We can get distracted by worldly success. By his fruits, we are often told, by the fruits of people, you will know them. And so for some, the way that you measure success is simply by power. It must be true because they win elections. It must be true because they have success in foreign lands. It must be true because he keeps the economy going. He must be true because we experience success in worldly terms. Now, there's nothing wrong with success per se. We all will have moments where we will succeed in the actions that we do in this life, and we pray that God will allow that prosperity to happen but my friends, this is not the be-all, end-all of whether one is king. This is not the be-all, end-all of whether one is powerful. Well, you might say, well, good grief, what is the be-all, end-all for it? And that is standing by the truth. Standing and enduring the truth. Seeing the bigger picture of what God is up to. Jesus is willingly sacrificing himself out of love, and he calls us to do the same. And you think that you don't have that call on your life? Have you not heard Jesus' words to his disciples? Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your burden. Take up your decision. Take up your sacrifice and do the same as I am doing. But we hesitate, don't we? We hesitate because we might get caught in something that is a miscarriage of justice. We might be pitied more than admired. We might be mocked and we might be spit at because I want to have some comforts. I want to have the success of this life. I want to have the worldly immediate success and not the long term not the long term truthfulness of what Jesus has to offer and that's where the message of today hits us 
when the Pope of uh, the 1920s, and I forget his name, established Christ the King Sunday, it was an interesting time, and it was in opposition to a number of political failures that were going on in Central America, and specifically Mexico. Mexico had a very totalitarian government that not only outlawed the church, but admired strong leaders who were anti-religion, anti-church, anti-God. It was also the era of Mussolini in Italy, a person who was admired not so much by his faithfulness to tradition as much as his machismo of being the strong leader who would save the nation and would lead them into economic prosperity, so he promised. We might say that his actual results were negligible, but he promised that. It was also the era that would one day rise Hitler. You see, it was an era where people openly mocked the power of God. And in the midst of this, the Pope of that time proclaimed the last Sunday of the year, Christ the King Sunday. You see, that's why this passage of Jesus' suffering on the cross is so important. Because Jesus isn't just king when he comes with all of his mighty horses at the end of time, with sword in his hand and shield to wreck justice and bring in the kingdom of God. I don't quite know all the theology of a neighboring church in Oatana. It's right next to Cabela's. And instead of a cross, it has a man, a knight on a white horse, a symbol of victory. You see, that's what we want our Jesus to look like. But instead, Jesus is showing us a tenacious rule, a tenacious victory, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of doing things that are not by the world considered kingly or successful, or even, for that matter, powerful. But it starts in that weakened point. By proclaiming truth. And in that weakened point, Jesus has compassion for the one who sees it and says to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. There's a famous chant in some parts of the churches that repeat the words of that man, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the promise is still the same, whether we see it or not, whether we feel it or not, or whether we see the world going our way or not. We affirm, no matter what happens this side of heaven, no matter how many dictators rise, no matter how many people will go after the false Christs of success and power, we still will proclaim Christ is king. And the question we need to ask ourselves is whether he's king of our life. Even in not just the bright sunny days of summer, but in the Novembers where we are in transition. In the Novembers where we are saying goodbye to the old and saying hello to the uncertain new. During the day where we begin like the Jews, where the day begins not at sunrise, but at sunset. Darkness, anticipated hours of darkness before there is the light of the new day. No, my friends, the new days begin on crosses. The new days begin in uncertainty. The new days begin when we ask Jesus in the midst of something we cannot understand. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so I pray that Jesus will remember you 
that Jesus will remember me and will always be with us and king, even when the answer is success and healing or simply placing ourselves into the hands of God, which Jesus was about ready to do when he died and said, Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus' final words from the cross, but not Jesus' final words. We too will speak our last someday. They will not be our final words from the cross, but they will be our final words in this life. And the question is, is whether we are going to put Jesus as king or we're going to mock him as others were tempted to do. Jesus died for your sins. Jesus rise for your resurrection. And Jesus will bring in the kingdom. And all we ask, is Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the assurance that our sins are forgiven, the assurance that our life is not ending in this life. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we trust you as king in the successes and in the failures of life. Bless us. Bless our journey. And bless our vision. In Jesus' name we pray. Who taught us to pray so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 46. Just as an aside, when Luther was looking for a, a hymn, and his famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress, is our God. It is based on Psalm 46. And notice how he's not saying that I am a mighty fortress, meaning Luther himself or even David himself. He is saying God is my refuge. God is my strength. God, Christ, is my hope. Psalm 46, beginning with verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved and though the mountains shake and in the depths of the sea, though its waters rage and foam and though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be shaken. God shall help it at the break of day. The nations rage and the kingdoms shake. God speaks and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, let us regard the works of the Lord. What desolations God has brought upon the earth. Beloved, the one, behold the one who makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still then and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. And so now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you today. I just want to say if you are able to come to church, we'd love to have you. 8.30 at Central, uh, 10.30 at East with Sunday School in between. Uh, Pastor Erica Cunningham will be uh, in my place th today, but she will preach a great sermon. You can also sit in your car and listen by means of our, our uh, FM transmitter.
We'd love to have you join us today. Take care. God bless. We'll see you next week or will join us for daily encouragement. Take care.